now and um, we've had a, a number of topics feature. Um, and so today we're going to have a paper in physical review research of our new, a new open access, well new, so almost two years now. So it, it's, it's hardly new, but for us still feel fresh. Um, it's a fully open access venue in case you haven't heard of it. Um, so all papers are published free to read, but obviously um, there is a bit of an APC. Um, and so uh, we have uh, picked a a recently published paper on, on multiferroics. Um, and so we're gonna have the authors of the paper um, give us a short presentation. Uh, it's gonna be moderated by one of our lead editors, Nicole Spalding. Uh, and so I'm gonna let her take over in a second, but before I do that, I just wanna advertise the next one in the series in case you're interested, in case you have colleagues that could potentially be interested. Um, so this one is going to be uh, a bit more fluid mechanics related. Um, it's going to happen on September 21st, as you can see there at eight in the morning, um, so New York time, you know, Eastern time. So it's about uh, 2 p.m. I think in Europe. That's right. If there is no daylight saving here, and it will be a paper in physical review fluids. As you can see it's collective organization and screening into dimensional turbulence, and it will be moderated by one of the associate editors of physical review fluids, uh, Luminita Danaila. So with that, I'm going to leave um, Nicola to do the, all the presentations. And if I can, there you go. Oh, maybe we can go here. And there you go, Nicola. You can take over. Thank you. Thanks, Juan Jose. So my name is Nicholas Fold, and I'm one of the co-lead editors of Physical Review Research. And as Juan Jose just said, this is the first of um, Physical Review Research's journal club. So I'm, I'm very excited as co-lead editor, I got to choose which paper um, would be presented and, and discussed today. Um, I chose this one for, th for three reasons. First, it's about multiferroics, which are materials that have both electric dipole moments and magnetic order, which are a topic of, that have been long of great interest for me. Um, and the behavior, the multiferroicity we're going to hear about was only possible, it was only possible to observe it because of the growth of, of single crystals and the, the uh, making these crystals, I think we might hear about this too, was extremely difficult. And I'm a huge admirer of crystal growers that can make these remarkable materials. And then finally, the characterization, the Raman spectroscopy, the interpretation of that also rested on some um, electronic structure calculations using density functional theory, which is another topic that's that's very close to my heart. So that was my motivation for choosing this paper, and I hope you en enjoy hearing about it. We have three of the authors with us today, so we're very privileged. And the presentation is going to be given by Ivan Adidson. So um, over to you, Ivan. You can share when you oh, want. Okay, let's start. Do you see my screen? We can see you perfectly well. We do, perfect. Take it over. Perfect. So thank you, uh, Juan and Nicola, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Today, I will present my Raman spectroscopic uh, study on rare earth nickelate single crystal which uh, reveal a central symmetry breaking expected for a multiferroic material. So first, I will give a short introduction on the family of uh, rare earth nickelates and present uh, its phase diagram. Then I will discuss the possible nickelate uh, magnetic structures. I will show you the single crystals I measured, the Raman setup I used. And then I will discuss the evolution of the uh, Raman spectra uh, as a function of temperature through the metal insulator transition and through the magnetic transition. And finally, I will discuss the possible displacement of the nickel atom due to the spontaneous uh, polarization. So this is the perovskite structures composed of octahedra of oxygen with the general formula ABO3. B is commonly a transition metal and sits at the center of uh, the octahedra. And A is commonly an alkali metal or a rare earth element. It sits at the center of uh, eight octahedra. In the case of uh, nickelate, uh, A is a rare earth and B is a nickel. Uh, the ideal perovskite structure is cubic, as you can see here. But due to the rare earth, the structure is deformed. The smallest the rare earth, the strongest is the deformation. It leads to the famous phase diagram of nickelate with the tolerance factor on the horizontal axis, which is linked to the deformation of the structure and the temperature on the vertical axis. Let's start with uh, lanthanum nickelate. Lanthanum has the largest 
a radius. The compound is not strong enough, therefore, to induce an insulating state. And therefore, it remains a paramagnetic metal even at a low temperature. Note that it adopts an, um, a trigonal crystal structure. Then there are praseodymium and neodymium nickelate, uh, which are paramagnetic metal at high temperature with an orthorhombic crystal structure and become antiferromagnetic insulators at a low temperature. The insulating phase is characterized by a breathing distortion, which means that there is an alternation between long bone and short bone octeda, as you can see here. The antiferromagnetic order is unusual with an up, up, down, down, and configuration along the 111 direction in the pseudocubic uh, representation. Um, note that uh, the space group is reported to be P21 over C, but uh, we will see that the symmetry is lower. And finally, the rest of the phase diagram from samarium to lutetium, lutetium has the smallest radius, which are paramagnetic metal at high temperature, undergo a paramagnetic insulating phase, and uh, become antiferromagnetic insulators at low temperature. In this study, we measured single crystals of neodymium, samarium, dysprosium, holmium, erbium, and yttrium uh, nickelate. So let's discuss uh, the possible uh, magnetic structures. First of all, note that the P21 over C space group is defined with this C axis. But it's more convenient to work uh, with the P21 over N space group, uh, which consider this C prime axis and allows uh, to check the symmetry operation more easily. Note also that the magnetic pro uh, propagation vector is one half zero one half in the P21 over N setting. Uh, and therefore, uh, only a few magnetic uh, structures are possible. Giovanetti et al proposed three different magnetic structures, the S, N, and T type. The S type is characterized by spin, uh, spin zigzag chain uh, within the AB plan, which are pointing in the same direction for adjacent C plan, as you can see here, left, 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 etc. The T type has similar uh, spin zigzag chain within the AB plan, but they are pointing in opposite direction for adjacent C plan, right, left, right, etc. And the N type is a non collinear uh, um, configuration uh, uh, where the spin with same orientation are on plan perpendicular to 101, as you can see here, 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 and the spin rotate 90 degrees uh, from one plan to the other. Tac, 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 tac. We consider also the X and M type, which have an up, zero, down, zero configuration. Uh, which is consistent with the extreme uh, park picture of a total charge disproportionation uh, with a spin S equal one on half of the nickel site and uh, S equal zero on the other half of the nickel site. From the P21 over C space group, simply double the A axis allows to host the X type uh, magnetic structures, magnetic uh, configuration. Uh, the two one screw axis and the C glide plane uh, symmetry operations remain. And therefore, the magnetic space group is P to A to one over C. This magnetic uh, space group is centrosymmetric. The S and uh, N type break the C glide plane symmetry operation. The magnetic space group is P to A to one and is non centrosymmetric. And the T type break the uh, two one screw axis symmetry operation. The magnetic space group is P to AC and is non centrosymmetric. And finally, uh, the M type break both two one screw axis and C glide plane symmetry operation. Uh, the magnetic space group is P to S one bar, and the, uh, uh, this magnetic space group uh, recover the centrosymmetric property. The free magnetic structures proposed by Giovanetti et al. are multiferroic. And Perez Mato et al. Uh, from a group theory argument assert that. The space group in the antiferromagnetic insulating phase is P2A to 1 and is multiferroic. So I will explain the multiferrosity for the S type, but the argument is similar for the N and T type. So here, four nickel plans along the C axis with the short bone octahedra symbolized by blue cycle and the long bone octahedra symbolized by red cycles. 
the upspin is represented by external cycle and the downspin is represented by internal column. Due to Pauli exclusion principle, the region between two nickel sites with parallel spin have a depletion of electron symbolized by this red shadow. And the regions between two nickel sites with anti-parallel spins have an accumulation of electrons symbolized by this uh, blue shadow. It results net electric polarization for each plan. And if we adopt all the plan for the S type, it results a net polarization along the B axis. So let's summarize. A non-central symmetric magnetic space group alongside with a breathing distortion induce uh, an electric polarization, which induce a breaking of the inversion symmetry in the crystal lattice. Indeed, due to the, polar the, the electric polarization, the nickel atoms uh, will move from their central symmetric uh, uh, position. And note that for a central symmetric molecule, the modes are either Raman active or infrared active. If the central symmetry is broken, the infrared active mode becomes Raman active and vice versa. So here, the single crystal we measured, they are the first ever reported single crystal of nickelate for this rare earth. And the process of growth is uh, uh, described in this reference. As you can see, they are very small, between 5 and 10 micrometer. And therefore, optical measurement, such as infrared reflectivity, is impossible. However, Raman spectroscopic uh, microscope is perfect for this kind of, of crystals and allows to host uh, to probe uh, possible uh, symmetry breaking. But how a Raman works? A 532 uh, uh, nanometer laser is focused on the sample by an objective, and the system uh, collects all the scattered uh, light. The scattered light is then sent on a spectrometer, which decomposes the different wavelengths. Here, a schematical representation of the physical process. And unlike infrared absorption, where the system passes from a low to an high energy level by absorbing a photon, in the case of elastic scattering, in the case of Rayleigh scattering, the system absorbs the photon, jumps to a virtual energy level, and when it relaxes, it relaxes to the same initial energy level and therefore emits a photon with the same energy as the initial one. But for inelastic scattering, for stocks and anti-stocks from uh, scattering, the system absorbs the photon, jump to the virtual energy level, and when it relaxes, it relaxes to an higher energy level than the initial one, and therefore emits a photon with a lower energy than the initial one. This is for the Stokes process, and for the anti-Stokes process, higher energy levels are thermally occupied. The system absorbs the photon, jump to the virtual energy level, and when it relaxes, it relaxes to a lower energy level than the initial one, and therefore emits a photon with a higher energy than the initial one. The Raman shift is simply defined. Uh, uh, with the difference between the uh, frequency of the incident photon and the scattered photon. It is possible to extract directly the temperature of the samples uh, uh, from the ratio between the Stokes and anti-Stokes signals. Uh, indeed, at very low temperature, only the ground state is occupied, and therefore there is no anti-Stokes signal. But at high temperature, higher energy levels are thermally occupied, which contribute to the anti-Stokes process. So we fit all the spectra uh, with uh, oscillators and use the temperature as a fitting parameter. So here are our results. On the left panels, uh, all the spectra in color map with the Raman shift on the horizontal axis, the temperature on the vertical axis on a log scale, and the colors represent the intensity on a log scale too. And on the right panels, the fitted frequency of the mode as a function of temperature for all the samples. The first observation is the increase of distinguishable mode through the metal to the insulated transition. However, according to factor group analysis, the number of modes in the orthorhombic or monoclinic crystal structure is, uh, is the same, is 24. But the appearance of the breathing distortion and the vanishing of the electron phonocoupling in the insulating phase uh, change the width, the frequency, and the intensity of the peak. And it's why uh, we can observe several modes in the insulating phase, which were completely overlapped 
in the metallic state. We observe also a huge decrease of the electronic background through the metal insulator transition, uh, which is simply due to the localization of uh, charges. Below the nil temperat nail temperature, we observe the appearance of a soft phonon for all the sample except, uh, samples except erbium and erbium nickelate here, 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 and here, symbolized by these red symbols in this panel. And according to the study of Lou et al., this soft mode is associated to the antiparmanetic resonance. Moreover, the mode at 650 in neodymium nickelate, symbolized by this green symbol, this soft mode, is likely a B magnet. But the most interesting observation is the increase of a large number of new modes below the nail temperature, uh, symbolized by these blue uh, symbols for all the samples. To convince you, let's observe the case of dysprosium nickelate. Below the nail temperature, we observe the appearance of the soft mode of the antiparmatic resonance, which crosses these phonons and sits at 120 inverse centimeter at low temperature. But we observe also the appearance of a mode at 260, 290, 310, 350, 550, and a less clear, but also here at 200 inverse centimeter. These new modes are a clear evidence of a central symmetry breaking where the infrared active mode uh, become Raman active. The fact that these modes appear as pair is a simple consequence that some Raman active mode and infrared active mode belong to the same vibrational uh, pattern. The only difference is the in-phase or phase uh, motion of uh, the atoms. The case of yttrium nickelate is of particular importance because above the nail temperature, we observe uh, 24 mod, which is the maximum number of mod uh, uh, allowed by factor group analysis. And below the nail temperature, we observe 31 modes. One of them is the soft mode, the antiparmatic resonance. So there are six more modes than allowed by factor group analysis, which means that the P21 over C space group is lower. Uh, we perform DFT calculation for this compound and uh, compute the Raman active mode here and the infrared active mode here. Uh, first, uh, you can see that uh, the calculation is in very good agreement with the experimental value. And by combining the Raman active uh, mode and the infrared active mode in this blue spectrum, you can observe that the mode appears as paired exactly as in our experimental result. Some of these peaks uh, appears just as a shoulder in the uh, Raman peak, exactly as in our experimental result. Polarized neutron diffraction experiment have proven the magnetic origin of the one half zero one half uh, super lattice. Consequently, the magnetic order modulates the force constant with the same lattice periodicity as the one in the paramagnetic state. Uh, it excludes the possibility that the additional modes are folded zone boundary phonons. For praseodymium uh, nickelate, Gavriluk et al. Uh, observed an unconventional dependence of uh, the lattice parameter below the nail temperature and an early perfect linear correlation between the breathing mode amplitude and the staggered magnetization. They concluded that there is a hidden order in the antiparmetic order, uh, insulating phase, sorry. Uh, likely the predicted polar distortion induced by the non centrosymmetric uh, magnetic order discussed by Giovanetti et al. and Perez, Mato uh, et al. Moreover, a recent study of uh, Serrano et al. Uh, reports a lattice anomaly below the nail temperature for europium nickelate, uh, particularly pronounced for the B lattice parameter, which uh, confirmed the previous intuition, uh, give additional support to our Raman finding. Uh, and support that the magnetic structure is S type. The spontaneous polarization occurring alongside with the magnetic order makes nickelate type 2 multiferrous. So let's conclude. Uh, we measured the first ever reported single crystal of nickelate. And below the nail temperature, we observe the appearance of the anti, uh, antiparmetic resonance, but also the appearance of a large number of new modes. 
Uh, these new modes are infrared active modes, which become Raman active due to the central symmetry breaking. And uh, polarization along the B axis is supported by recent observation, uh, which indicate uh, the, uh, that the magnetic order is certainly S type. And we conclude uh, that uh, uh, nickelates are multiphoric materials. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Ivan, for that very clear presentation. And also, I'm very happy that you, you and your colleagues chose to submit this work to Physical Review Research. Um, we have time for questions. People can either type the questions in, in the chat or use the raise hand button. And I'll try to either myself or Juan Jose, if we, we look for the raised hands, um, and then we'll ask you to unmute yourselves and you can ask your questions yourself, whichever you prefer. Um, but maybe since people are always very shy on Zoom, <laughs> on Zoom talks, I will I will get started with a um, with a question. Um, I'm not sure if it's really for you, Ivan, or for your um, your co-author Marisa Madade. Maybe to comment a little bit on um, the importance of having the single crystals. What were you able to do that you wouldn't have been able to do if you just had ceramic samples or powders? And also tell us a little bit about the challenge that you had with um, with the growth of the single crystals, please. Um, I don't know if uh, Marisa, do you want to start to, to answer? I, I can uh, start the answer. Um, the use of a single crystal has uh, two ma a major interest, uh, the control of the chemistry and the homogeneity of the samples and the abs uh, absence of diffusion of uh, a cleaved su uh, surface. Uh, the latest is uh, an advantage, uh, especially for the analysis of uh, the electronic background. And about the, the process of growth, maybe uh, Marisa uh, uh, can complete. So, uh, so the thing of people also working on these um, systems probably know that uh, even in ceramic form, they are very, very difficult to prepare. And uh, for example, the lutets and single crystals, they could only be prepared with a uh, pressure of uh, 20 kilowatts was the, the smallest pressure that uh, has been used to prepare these uh, small nickelates. Uh, in our laboratory, so the highest pressure we can use is only two kilowatts, but I was lucky to have an uh, extremely talented uh, uh, so postdoc, yeah, so Darek Gabriluk, which I think is on the audience, who had, um, I mean, a great idea and is basically the, the one behind uh, the success in the synthesis that almost everybody thought uh, is, was impossible. So maybe Darek, if you are around, uh, could, you, uh, could you comment on that, on the details of the synthesis? Darek, would you like to add, add anything? Just unmute yourself if you would like to. No, I don't, I don't see. Okay, we come back to Darek later, maybe. If you, oh, there, there we go. And may I ask something? Yeah, just one moment. Just one moment, Frank. I think um, Darius is going to going to comment on the um, synthesis, and then. Um... Uh, so, do, do you hear me now? Yes, we um, hear you now. Okay, that, that perfect. So, regarding the uh, difficulties of the synthesis, though, so that question should be rather addressed to the chemists who were working uh, last uh, seventy years. Uh, on the crystal growth of nickelates. Uh, but uh, mm, to be honest, uh, first of all, we were very lucky to, to be able to combine our knowledge of the crystal growth and uh, the unique uh, setup which we have uh, in the FPSI. Because it's not just only the high pressure setup, but also uh, very large gradient of temperature. Uh, which allows us to, to apply hydrothermal growth in the gradient of temperature. And uh, in the case of difficulties, uh, we were really very surprised with the size of the crystals because we, we, our, our background is, uh, of course, the neutron uh, scattering and the crystals were a bit too small for, for us and uh, only only, only problems which were struggling, uh, it was not the growth itself, but uh, the size and handling of the crystals. But uh, after that, I, I would say it was quite easy. 
<laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, Frank, Frank Lichtenberg, did you have a follow-up question about the synthesis? And then we'll go to the people. I see now I have some hands raised from Rafael Jaramillo, Jennifer Fowley, and a question in the chat. But I'm guessing Frank will be asking about the growth. So I'll, Frank, I'll let you ask your question next. Yeah, Marisa, maybe, um, is, is there, uh, when considering the oxygen content, so is, is there, um, also an evidence for the ex existence of the hexagonal phase uh, of the type yttrium manganese oxygen 3. For, for example, when, when, when the oxygen content is perhaps somewhat lower than 3, is, is there something known about this? Um, as far as I know, uh, I mean, these perovskites also, when they have uh, so a uh, big amount of uh, oxygen vacancies, they keep the thrombic structure. So of course, not all of them have been investigated in this uh, respect, yeah. So, but there are uh, a few works, yeah, where uh, people investigated this particular question. So the structure is maintained, but uh, what happens is that the properties change. So you, uh, I mean, the, the um, the transition temperatures uh, so move, and also the hysteresis in the metal insulator transition becomes much, 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 much uh, larger. But uh, just to answer to your question, I'm not aware of any hexagonal phase in this uh, nickelate system. Yeah. Thank you, Marisa. Thanks for the question, Frank, and thanks, thanks for the discussion about the synthesis. Let me move on to um, Rafael Jaramillo. Rafael, would you like to just unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. I miss being in rooms with people asking questions. So thank you, Nicola. For <laughs> so my question is, is an interesting paper. Um, it's sort of all about the order of magnitude of these effects. So, um, so for instance, uh, what size is the predicted displacement of the nickel site? Um, that's interesting because it suggests um, the dipole moment, which I was also going to ask you for the calculated value. It also suggests um, experiments like XAPS, which could be done on powders, right, and could sort of couple to this without um, needing even bigger crystals, you know, which is always going to be what people ask for. Um, so I wonder whether you can comment on, on, the, on the magnitude here um, or of the polarity. And then uh, Coupling more to other experiments, right? Um, is there, you might simulate a powder XRD pattern from that and ask whether you could do simply high resolution synchrotron powder XRD um, to confirm. Um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll, and the other question is about switching, right? Um, I don't wanna get sort of pedantic here and say, oh, this isn't fair electricity because it hasn't switched. Uh, that's not what I mean by this question, but I, I am just scientifically curious. Um, have you thought about, um, uh, kinetic mechanisms uh, for switching the polarity. So um, two questions, I'll mute myself and thank you. All right, um, so I joined uh, Ivan uh, so we can consult each other. We are, we are sitting same. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the size of the effect, uh, honestly, we have not tried to calculate that back uh, from the observed uh, Raman uh, signals. Um, the, uh, I guess it's, it should be possible to do so because if we haven't done it. Um, I'm not sure, Marisa, if you uh, if, want to say anything about things, uh, other experiments that, that, that could reveal more directly what the size of these displacements is. Uh, uh, well, there are some predictions. So there is a paper by, uh, so one of the authors is uh, Picozzi, yeah? So DFT work where they, uh, I mean, made some some predictions, yeah, but uh, I mean, the polarization was relatively large, but uh, in fact it was not exclusively along the the b-axis. So uh, I don't know how I mean how uh, uh, how how to consider this this work. Let's say it. Or, on the other side. So here the propagation vector is commensurate. And uh, so most probably, so the, uh, so the, the origin of the magnetic order is uh, super exchange. So probably, so this kind of mechanism, so uh, at least what compared with what has been predicted for other multiferroics, so uh, 
you could have a so larger polarization that, for example, in, in a spiral multiferroic, just because of the because of the size of the of the magnetic coupling that uh, couples to the lattice. And uh, yeah, so how to reveal this? So uh, of course, the ideal thing will be to measure polarization directly in one of these tiny crystals, but this requires some special equipment so that we don't have, unfortunately, yeah, because that they are very small. You should be able to contact them, to cut them, so uh, to orient them. So it's, it's, it's a bit complicated. Uh, concerning indirect, indirect methods, for example, for the symmetry decrease and the identification of the space group, you can do a um, single crystal X-ray diffraction. Uh, the problem is that these crystals are extremely perfect. Hmm. So, um, so basically what you would expect is uh, new reflections below a TN, okay? And uh, they could be observed in principle, yeah? But uh, when you have crystals that are very perfect, very often, so you have uh, so um, fake reflections, and uh, if you, just because because you have double scattering, so something that uh, is difficult to avoid. Yeah. So if you see new reflections, uh, is uh, you have to decide if this is true, or this is because of this uh, double scattering. Mm -hmm. So uh, this can be possible. You can do the temperature dependence of this. Uh, I mean, of this experiment, but again, it's, it's something a bit uh, time consuming, yeah. Uh, I think mm -hmm. if somebody has equipment, probably the most direct uh, way will be to try to measure directly polarization. Yeah. But yeah, the, um, uh, so in principle, I think from looking at the Raman, so we, in the paper, we put a simulation where, in fact, Iman showed, showed it also, where we say, okay, uh, if we uh, activate infrared modes, uh, and we assume that that uh, the intensity of those are about what is it, 10 or 20 percent or so of the Raman uh, of the usual Raman modes, then we are in the right ballpark to uh, to simulate uh, what we see in the experiment. So in principle, uh, from that number, or what, whatever you need to uh, to activate these infrared modes, uh, of course you can you should be able to calculate back which what the amplitude of displacement. That would correspond to. We simply haven't done it, but it's actually a good idea to try. Yeah, this in this way you can actually give guidance to people doing uh, X-ray experiments uh, in which ball in which ballpark they should look for uh, uh, amplitude displacements away from uh, central symmetric. Yeah. I'd like to um, ask a question from the chat, which is kind of a follow up to this from Menke Jane about um, how does the polarization change with the R across the RNIO3 series? Do you know in which direction it goes? As your tiltings get bigger, um, does the polarization go up or down? It should go up, I'm guessing, but... Um... So we have no idea which uh, direction it points actually. Uh -huh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, just, it's just a prediction, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 the prediction, it most likely is S-type and then it's along the B-axis. But uh, it, it could be that along the series, uh, you actually go from, uh, from the S to the T-type. T oh, type. okay. Uh, yeah, I think the question was just about, will it get bigger or smaller? If you, let's say you stayed in the same magnetic ordering, but you're... Um, for the region of the series if where overall the magnetic ordering is, is the same, but the tilting is, is increasing, does that make the polarization go up or, or, or down? Uh, just the size of the polarization. Yeah, yeah the size. I mean, the strongest it should be the higher, answer. yes. So the strongest higher. force mass area. I mean, just based on the experiment, you would say the strongest case was the yttrium. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That was exactly. the clearest effect. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you for that question. Um, let me move on to the next um, raised hand here, Jennifer Fowley. Would you like to um, unmute yourself? and ask your question, please. Yes. Hello, Denis-Pierre. Hi, oh. Hi Yvonne. <laughs> um, yeah, so the last I heard, um, there was still some debate for the Nicolates if the spin density wave was collinear or non-collinear with um, conflicting conclusions from, I think, neutron diffraction and um, resonance soft X-ray scattering. Um, do you know for your samples if it is truly up, up, down, down, collinear, like you said, and uh, would this even change somehow your, your argument? Is it the same space group anyway? Does it matter? 
Okay. No, we cannot say with the experiment uh, if it's uh, up, up, down, down, or up, zero, down, zero. And uh, the, uh, the huge difference is uh, if it's the uh, S type, the polarization is along the B axis, but if it's uh, uh, N or T type, the polarization should be along the AC plane. So it could be also a possibility to know uh, uh, the direction of the polar polarization. But about the, the, the magnetic structure, we don't know. Well, the thing that's sure, but that you also know, is that, that, that it is, is uh, one, one, one direction. Uh, and, and that's fourfold. And, and uh, indeed, the, uh, the, uh, apparently, it's not possible uh, on, on the basis of uh, Newton diffraction. Uh, well, the, the problem is that uh, they are single crystals, but they are too small for single crystal Newton diffraction. That is the, the technique that could better, better address this question. Yeah. So we, you have to do it with uh, neutron powder diffraction. And uh, there we have the, the question of, of the superposition and also the fact that the moment is very small. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult to say. Yeah. So but would it change anything? I mean, if, it, if it's this kind of spiral that some people see? Yes, yes. I mean, this is what uh, I think Ivan or, or uh, Dirk said. Yeah. So the polarization of the, it will be in a different direction. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So actually related to that question, I wonder, Ivan, if you could pull up the beautiful slide you had right at the start of all of the antiferromagnetic, possible antiferromagnetic structures below the Nael temperature, because I think that came right at the beginning when people were still trying to join and somebody just asked that in the chat. Um, but you have a lovely slide showing all of the possibilities. Uh, let me try to... No. Uh... My computer don't want to. Let me share again. Okay, no, I don't know why I can I can't come back. Okay, let me try something else. Sorry. Oh, up <laughs> Is it right. frozen? Yes, yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. Okay. Yes, this one. Um, yeah, and so the one that was focused on was the was the S type, but these are all possible structures that have been proposed for the person who asked about. Um, yeah. The so this one, the polarization the should be in the B direction, um, and for both of them should be in the AC plane. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a, a question in the chat here. I'm not sure I understand, but maybe you do. It says, why do you use nickel metal in Raman spectra? Um, Say it again. Does that mean something to the... It, the question says in the chat, why do you use nickel metal in Raman spectra? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I thought I'd ask it in case you did. If the person who posted that would like to explain, otherwise we'll move on to another question. Um. Okay, probably. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I, 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 sorry, no, I think I, the answer would be that we just wanted to study these nickelates. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then automatically yeah. It's and they are metallic at high temperature and, and yeah. isolators at low temperature. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh, okay, and maybe the question is why, yeah, why did you choose metallic nickelates? Okay, yeah, do you want to give us a philosophical um, answer to that? Why, why you chose this for your PhD project or your postdoc project, Ivan? No. Why I use nickelate? Yeah, why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, Dirk proposed uh, to uh, continue my uh, master project on lanthanum nickelate, and then Marisa. Uh, offer us the opportunity to uh, measure this first uh, ever reported single crystal. So it was a, a, a nice opportunity for me for my thesis. Yeah, very good reason, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we have one more question in the chat. If anybody would like to ask a question live, remember you can just push, push the, the raise hand button. Um, and this I think you addressed a little bit already, your choice of um, Raman spectroscopy. Why, what, what's particularly suitable um, about Raman spectroscopy compared with other characterization tools that you could have you could have chosen. 
shall I say? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so actually this goes a bit back also to how, how this collaboration came about. Actually it was um, uh, Marissa at some point uh, mentioned to us that she started to, to get or she had actually produced uh, single crystals and uh, opportunistic uh, as I am, I said, can I get them? <laughs> <laughs> Even without having any idea what to, what to do with it, my first thought was to do infrared spectroscopy because that that's what we do most in, in my lab. But we also have Raman facilities, and uh, so soon when I, I learned what the actual size of the samples was, infrared or any kind of other straightforward optical spectroscopy was excluded. Uh, you could, in principle, think of doing, uh, say, near field optics because that doesn't require big samples. But even there, it's a bit an issue of to find your samples. Um, and so uh, it was quick, quickly became clear that Raman would be the, the only way for us at least to do a spect spectroscopy on it. Uh, that, that said, we have discovered a lot of things. Of course, it's also true that Raman has a lot of advantages. So uh, in, in retrospect, you can say, okay, Raman uh, doesn't require very complicated uh, calibration methods, for example, as you would have to do in, in optics most of the optics at least, um, it's compatible with a lot of things. It's, uh, Raman can be easily combined with, uh, with a low temperature rig, also with a low temperature and pressure rig. Uh, it's very perfectly compatible with, uh, with uh, you don't need vacuum really. Uh, it's compatible with magnetic fields of any kind. So it, it offers a large flexibility of environment where you can apply it. Even then it was, uh, still problematic to uh, to even see those samples in Raman spectroscopy, and one of the things that turned that turned into an advantage, I should say, is um, the tininess of the crystals uh, invited us to explore an entirely different way than we ever did before to modify and to change the temperature of these crystals, because just the laser light of the laser is powerful enough to warm up these samples to uh, to even to thousand degrees or, or or above, even some of them you got very close to melting, and uh, of course that's the nice thing about Raman. You can probably don't need small crystals for it, but it is not a, it's not a, an impediment to have small crystals because you collect your Raman signal precisely where the laser laser is heating. It's the same laser that you use for the heating that's also used for collecting uh, your data. And that's something that uh, that just came as a big surprise uh, to me, at least, that we could do it in this way. Of course, it is very well known that Raman uh, is is a way to measure temperatures using Stokes anti-Stokes uh, spectroscopy at the same time. But to combine that with the laser for the heating was just a new uh, possibility. And I think that that's actually something that would that extends beyond just doing Raman. If you have other techniques that uh, probe a small part of your sample, think of, uh, say, uh, uh, second harmonic generation, which certainly is something you would like to do in these kind of samples, then Raman could be used as a tool to measure uh, the temperature there where you want to know it also. But that said, you know, even with the Raman, it was it took a long, at some point we got a little bit desperate about uh, how to, to get a sample. <laughs> A signal out of these samples. In the end, the best way was just to spread them randomly on a surface, and and then with the microscope look for for your crystals, which still means that they are not. I mean, there's no good control about how they are oriented. So polarization analysis was not an option on on these samples yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's kind of a, a follow up question in the in in the chat here asking whether you see any. Um, evidence of defects, for example, do you see vibrational lines from oxygen vacancies? Is that something that you would be able to resolve? We see very, very few, none of that uh, of the kind we, one usually finds in, in oxides. Uh, mm. uh, there are a few residual lines that you also find if you look in the paper. Uh, in the erbium, for example, there is a line a little bit above, uh, it's quite narrow actually, which is probably we actually don't know exactly what it is, but it's, uh, it is in the right neighborhood uh, for being a, uh, a 4F uh, crystal field excitation. That's probably what it is. Uh -huh. Okay, interesting. Yeah. But uh, no, it, it's known from films also in these samples, you can have pretty broad oxygen vacancy uh, peaks that we don't see. 
So okay. that tells me that they are probably quite free of auction. Uh, Highly stoichiometric, uh, yeah. So you would see them if, you, if they were there, you think? Yeah, yeah, you would see them. Okay, oh, very good. Um, we have a raised hand again. Um, Rafael Aramillo again, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh, I had another question, um, which uh, I was hoping we could talk about because it's interesting me, which is the idea of switching. And so, um, you know, this is a really complicated system. If you think about the magnetic order and, and a polar distortion and um, with, I'm not an expert in paraelectrics, but I, I listen to experts in paraelectrics and there's often analysis of the saddle point, right? Between two uh, en energy equivalent um, polar directions. And this couples to um, the sort of crystal distortions that are required for switching. And you could study this with nudge elastic band theory. And so it couples to a lot of things that we do. And here it's also coupled to um, antiferromagnetism. So I'm looking at the at your figure four, and I'm kind of going dizzy, like trying to imagine um, what is required to switch the polarity. Um, it's not an exchange of of the breathing mode octahedra, so that's that's good because that would be hard to imagine. Um, so. Have you thought about that? Let me suggest, for instance, thinking about um, the AFM domain walls, right? There's two different types of antiferromagnetic domain walls in general. Would you expect the polarity reversal across domain walls? I mean, this sort of suggests processing routes to maybe even producing larger uh, monodomain polar samples, which could be measured at some point, or suggests why that would be hard, um, right? With field cooling or, or so forth. So. I wonder if you could sort of talk about generally what you know about switching the polarity and how it couples to switching the magnetism and, and the sort of magnetic texture that might evolve in such crystals. That's a really good question, I think. So, uh, well, so, you know, it's, it's difficult to answer this question because we don't even know what is the direction of the polarization. We don't know, uh, I mean, how these uh, eventual distortions look like, if they are big or small. So it's, um, I don't know, I think, I think it's a bit early just to, 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 to answer this question. You know, I think the, as I told you, I think that the first thing will be to, to, to measure polarizations in, in, in normal conditions, yeah, and, uh, and then think after, yeah. Yeah, but there's one point. But, but I guess if I can interject, one of the, Oh, sorry, we're talking yeah, about may, may, may interrupt. I mean, there are, of course, things also ahead, things Jack, yeah. that we are discussing uh, as a group of authors still and having to be sort, sorted out. But at least there's one interesting point here, and that is this, uh, this what's known, indicated here as X type, which is central symmetric. Actually, if you look in, uh, I mean, we don't have the figure on display, but it is in, in Elon's thesis. Um, if you look at the series of symmetry breakings that is necessary to get to, let's say, S type, then actually, no, no, just keep it this way. Okay. Then actually, you would go from uh, the uh, mono, no, you would go from um, the uh, uh, orthorhombic uh, uh, PBM and M structure uh, first uh, to monoclinic, which is insulating but not yet uh, antiferromagnetic. And then you would actually lower the symmetry first uh, to still the monoclinic structure, but where you, where, where you would have uh, half uh, of your spins, uh, say, or half your sides with spins and the other half uh, without any spins at all. And then only you would go to either S or T. So actually from the symmetry point of view, the X type is the one that would be favored for your system. It, it actually would like to land there, uh, if you want to break as few symmetries as possible, coming from the uh, from the paramagnetic phase, of course, I, I can't say I fully understand this, but I su su suppose that that doesn't happen that way, simply because you have to suppress spins entirely on certain sides, and that comes with a certain cost of energy, and then it is just more favorable to break one additional symmetry and end up in one of these uh, non-central symmetric phases. However, that said. Uh, this uh, central symmetric uh, X type phase would indeed uh, represent a sort of intermediate step uh, before it goes uh, uh, multiferroic. And so that would represent, in that sense, a, a saddle point. And even there, you could imagine uh, that it, it has the choice of uh, having the blue ones uh, being the red ones and vice versa. So, depending on that starting point, 
uh, you would end up in uh, in a ferrolactic, multiferro phase with the, the polarization pointing one way or the other. So it would be the starting point of, of forming these different uh, domains that you are referring to. But, yeah, uh, that's really interesting. Um, I guess I would just caution, like for the experiments, um, right, since the the polar order here is the tail and the magnetism, which derives from the electronic structure, ultimately is the dog, right? That you, know, you could propose a hero experiment to somebody to measure polarization and, and they're doomed to failure because the magnetic texture is such that these are nanometric domains and, you know, and the net polarization cancels out and no reasonable field that they're going to apply will yank um, the structure uh, into a down. configuration. So it's just, you know. Yeah. And unless you cool down through the antiphonetic transition in an applied electric field. Right, one could imagine that. Yeah, so that's anyway. Um, anyway, yeah, so thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the interesting question. Yeah, I think it's certainly the case that the opposite antiferromagnetic domains are going to have opposite polarizations. And so, as Dirk suggested, a magnetoelectric annealing to select a single domain might be necessary. Um, we're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. Thank you for the wonderful talk, the lovely paper, the um, congratulations on the beautiful crystals. Does anybody have any last um, questions before we let our kind speakers go and enjoy their evening here? It's getting to kind of aperitif time, I think, in Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, sure if you think about things um, afterwards, you, the contact information is in, in, in the paper, of course, so you'll be able to... Um, ask follow-up questions um, by email. So then let me just thank particularly Ivan and also um, Marisa Madade, Dirk van der Maal and, um, and Derek Garilok for, for joining us today and presenting their really interesting work. And um, thanks very much to all of you for the lively discussion. I have to admit, I was a little bit nervous that nobody would ask any questions on Zoom and um, it has been, it's not been that, that situation at all. It's been a very lively, very interesting discussion. So thank you all very much for, for joining in. I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Nicola. It was a great opportunity.